Hey guys, what's up? Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash eggs show. That's E G G S S H O W. Audible has more than 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or just about any device you can imagine. As Eggs listeners, you can download a free audiobook today by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash eggs show. Hi guys, it's Matt with Silverman Solutions, and this is your Marketing Minute. Man, it seems like everybody's talking about the Fire Festival documentaries that are on Hulu and Netflix. And if you don't mind, I'd like to share my two cents. One of the biggest takeaways is when you have important business tasks to do, get them in the right order. Don't do your marketing first and set ridiculous sky-high expectations that you can never hope to fulfill. Start with brand strategy. This helps you identify the needs of your ideal customers and your core values, and then you move forward with your marketing. Otherwise, you set yourself up for failure or fraud. In this case, you have been warned. All right, guys, see you next time. Bang ding ding, trademark. Ah, he come out. Six foot seven tall. Bang ding ding, one is star. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to Eggs. On this week's show, we've got a very special guest for you. Her name is Mace Serafi. Mace is a designer, educator, and entrepreneur living and working in Santa Monica, California. Her company, Mace Serafi Designs, specializes in helping companies tell their stories in new and authentic ways to grow their brands and deliver value to their customers. In addition to her work, Mace can be found at California State University, Long Beach, and Los Angeles campuses where she teaches typography. Originally, we came to know Mace by way of friends of the show, Chris Doe and Melinda Livesey, and only a few weeks back, I was lucky enough to meet her in person while visiting Southern California. She has recently collaborated with another friend of the show, Zach Schmies, on typophobia, the principles of typography, for his company, Straight Method, which you can find at straightmethod.com. Also coming up, Mace will be on the jury for an interscholastic tournament for high school creatives looking to pursue a career in graphic design this coming March 30th at the University of Riverside. In addition, you can find her being a part of the IGA portfolio review this coming June for graduates of the University of Dominguez Hills. I don't know how she made time for us, but she managed, and we're thrilled to have her. Joining us now from Santa Monica, California, please welcome to the show, Mace Serafi. Thank you for making the time to come on with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for moving your schedule around a few times. (laughs) Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It should be awesome. So I I noticed on the back wall there, it looks like that might be some of your artwork up there. Is that something you've done? Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, my fascination with Arabic calligraphy and typography. That's always kind of around me. That's awesome. What what does it say? What? uh, Um, it says uh, it's it's kind of like a small phrase that says, uh, "God bless this home." God protect this home. I kind of did it when I was first getting married. So I was like, okay, let's do something just to kind of inspire hope, inspire fear, inspire all those different kinds of ideas in terms of like 
home in terms of like typography in terms of inspiration so i love like it a it's cool project thank you yeah, yeah. if you uh, cruise over to macy's site which is macy and i should probably spell that out it's m-a-e-c-e dot com. That's your portfolio site. You'll see lots of really cool uh, Arabic typography on the website. It's awesome. Um, so let's uh, let's get the show on the road. First, Macy, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, where you come from, all that good stuff. Yeah, so a little bit about my background. Uh, I was born in San Francisco. Um, and like I said earlier, I was uh, raised in Damascus, Syria. Um, and then I, I went to an American school there from early on in my childhood years up until high school. And um, it was a very interesting upbringing. So I went to an American school there. So I got both the American and the Arabic cultures, kind of like a hybrid upbringing in that uh, country. Um, and then we would come here to the U.S. during the summers because um, my dad had a business in San Francisco in real estate. So. I mean, it was very much focused on creativity, focused on the arts. Um, That's kind of what I always knew what I wanted um, to do as a really young kid, um, to be in the creative field. So it started off in a very vibrant culture. So Damascus was a really good place for that to start. And then coming to San Francisco and then kind of being a little bit more curious about schools here, Um, as I wanted to graduate and kind of move forward in my career, I decided, you know, it'd be great to just kind of look at where that can take me in terms of a future, in terms of a career. Well, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, both of those cities, Damascus and San Francisco are, you know, of course, known for their arts and, and uh, being raised around all that creativity. Uh, Does that sort of current of creativity run in your family too? Are there other people in your family that are sort of creatively inclined? Yeah. Um, my mom is definitely creatively inclined, uh, definitely someone who's good with um, her hands in terms of uh, crafts and terms of painting, in terms of like just making things. She's definitely a maker. Um, and uh, my dad kind of has a little bit of a poetry streak in him too. So it kind of comes from both sets of parents, those sides. So it's all great on that end. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that you've always been interested in art and design and sort of, you know, uh, inspired by those things. What do you yourself do? Like, do you draw? Do you paint? Do you do any of that kind of stuff? I mean, I guess you paint. You did the thing on the back wall. But I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, you know it, I guess that's what are your trades or your trades or your tools of the trade? I mean, I, that's how it started. It first started out just experimenting with different mediums. So painting was one of them. Um, and then drawing was another medium as well. Um, taking a look at what kinds of materials would work best. Um, and then slowly that kind of just evolved into a little bit more of a conceptual uh, way of working. So how do we combine technology into our art making and uh, technical skill sets? How do those two combine together? So it was really just more about seeing you know, where we can take that um, methodology into something that can be more of like a viable business um, and then kind of grow that and nurture that. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like, so you come from an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial family. Uh, it sounds like dad was in business and in, in real estate. Um, mm-hmm. I guess, you know, there's, there's sort of, at least in my mind, having worked around a lot of creative people, I sort of see there's a couple different kinds, right? There's the, the type of artist that really just wants to be an artist. And those are the ones you see in society that are kind of our starving artists, right? They, they work for the, the craft because it's beautiful to them and that's what they want, what they want to do. Um, then there are people who are sort of commercial artists, which is sort of the, the realm I fall under. So like I, you know, I draw, I, I illustrate, I used to paint when I was younger, stuff like that. And, but for me, it always yeah. made sense to move into something commercial, right? Like, I mean, I, I wasn't going to paint for paint's sake, probably. Um, while some people might, and there's plenty mm. of hybrids out there. But are you, um, sure. do you find that you sort of were naturally inclined to that entrepreneurial spirit as well? And that's how we ended up in business all these years later? Or did you fall into it through some other way? Uh, no, uh, that was something that had to be taught and learned um, as we kind of, uh, Kind of you hone your skill sets as a creative um it's it's not something i was um i was very uh in tune with until i started to go here i do this on my own and start my own business what is it that i needed 
I was around it growing up, but I didn't really know what direction I wanted to go in. So it, it was definitely something that I had to teach myself, um, go look at different kinds of role models who are in that field, who are preaching the idea of like you're marketing your services. It just so happens that you're in the business of selling brand strategy and brand identity. Um, so it's a definite uh, transition, um, but learning a creative was definitely a good first start and then kind of evolving that into a more uh, creative entrepreneurial uh, design practice uh, was definitely more in line with where I see myself now as opposed to where I was in high school or something. Sure. So you went to grad school at uh, the California Institute of Arts. Um, yeah. Did you get into, like after you graduated, did you go into a you know, nine to five at a agency or have you been self-employed the whole time? No, I, I got into a nine to five. Um, and I'm, and I say it's, it's good to go into a nine to five first, just so you can understand what the business is about and the industry demands are. So I was there for about like, I want to say four years, um, okay. until I decided, but I, it was a little bit crazy because, um, I was freelancing on the side too, which I don't recommend for everyone. It's not for all. That seems but, to be a um, common trait though. Ryan did that. A few other people we've talked to have done that as well. They'll, they'll... Yeah, I think it's pretty common, but like to, to Macy's point, it's definitely not for the week. Like, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's no, a, a whole thing. No, 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 not at all. But I mean, if that's where you want to start, if you want to start building your business and your client list, at something where you start to start at some point and then you kind of go there. So what was like the deciding factor to kind of move on to your own thing? Did you just eventually build up enough work to where you knew you would be fine if you quit or was it kind of, I'm done with this. I just want to focus on something else and, and jump. It was, it. Um, it was a combination of things. First of all, I was just, I hit a wall and said, well, okay, is this it? I mean, is this all that I'm going to be learning? Is there, What's the next step? So at, first of all, I hit a wall in that way. And then I was told by uh, my creative directors, like, well, you can look for other positions. And so I, I tried that. And then I felt like when I did make that jump, um, most of the creative team was let go within a few months. And so I had already contemplated that I wanted to be on my own, um, just figuring out like if I had enough clients and then I had enough projects to put in my portfolio, that would kind of be enough. Um, but it did have to come to a place where I was ready to make that jump and then say, you know what, I think it's best that I be on my own. Cause I kind of lost loyalty to what the industry was about working nine to five. So um, for me, it was more like, okay, I, I learned what I needed to about the industry and then let's see if I can do this on my own now and then build a team and then see if there's interest in terms of like clients coming in um, and then it just kind of grow it that way. But we had to do that while I was at the nine to five. And yeah, no, I think that's a pretty common experience among people. You know, I, I mean, in my uh, experience, I was working, well, I wouldn't call it a nine to five. I was working for an ad agency. So it was more like a seven to seven or something, <laughs> but, uh, but I was working in the ad agency business and basically got laid off. And that was sort of what, well, I guess my first layoff, I was working in book publishing and, and got laid mm. off, went out on my own, went back to work for an ad agency, got laid off, went back out on my own. And mm -hmm. so, but each time for me anyway, and, and I'm sort of not naturally real brave in that, in that sense. I, you know, needed that nudge. Like that was the thing that pushed me out. I had been doing the the late hours and doing the freelancing and all that stuff. So when I did go out, I landed on my feet. Like I had already built up some clientele. I'd already built up some reputation, things like that. But, um, but it, you know, it was still kind of too scary or too bold of a move for me to do on my own. I really needed that layoff. So, yeah, no, of course you definitely need the first step in every way. Yeah. Do you have um, advice for young designers? Anybody like that looking to make that step? I think largely what you're describing about hitting the wall, um, mm -hmm. I think is a really common occurrence for creative people stuck working in a nine to five, whether they're working in house yeah. someplace or working in agency. I think just the creative brain gets stifled when you're stuck like that. And so I think I think it's a really common experience among creative people. Um, yeah. You know, speaking from your own experience and then just from what you've learned from others, uh, being active in the community, do you have anything that you can share, uh, advice or ideas how to make that first step? 
Yeah, I think what I what really helped me was um, first being active in the community before even making that jump. Um, so um, I would go to AIGA meetings. Um, I would also go to like different meetups and just try to surround myself with creatives uh, because that's something that I knew I was missing when I was in the nine to five environment. Um, so before even making that jump, just having cultivate that uh, community um, and also, um, you know, always be able to talk to a lawyer or two, um, just know like what it is that you're getting yourself into. And then also um, talking to prospects too, in terms of like where they can see themselves working with you or you working with them in the future. So it's just, you're kind of establishing rapport before you're even out there to begin with. Um, so kind of just the build blocks before you even um, leave the workforce because it yeah. is sometimes a jump. I think that makes sense, you know, just kind of setting up the safety net before you leap off. Um, oh, for sure. You mentioned yeah. um, surrounding yourself with creatives and things like this, and this is a topic that comes up here on occasion. Uh, what do you think about the like the prospect of mentorship and finding a mentor? Is, is do you, Have you found anybody in your life that that works really well for, uh, with? Or have you found, you know, it's better to just surround yourself in a community of people and sort of learn from everyone versus having one guy, you know, steer the ship for you or help you through your career? Yeah, I, I felt like it was a combination of both, honestly. Um, having that sense of camaraderie with other creatives is definitely important because we get to just pass different projects to one another when the our plate is pretty full. Um, having a mentor was also important, especially for me, the business side, I needed mentoring that way um, because uh, it was just a field that, that was new to me. And I knew that if I had a little bit more um, intention and a little bit more knowledge about just the marketing side and the business side of what I do, I think it would have made things a lot more uh, clear. So I definitely recommend having a mentor um, guidance throughout the way. I mean, it helps because we're, we're, we're always going about this in a way where we're lifelong learners. We're trying to keep up on like what the new trends are in business and in marketing. And that should always help feed our business no matter what. So it doesn't really stop no matter what, what phase you're in. Well, even outside of like the, the design aspect of it, just the business uh -huh. side of it, like accounting, uh, sending invoices sure. and getting contracts and keeping your, oh, yeah. you know, all that side stuff is stuff you don't even think about until you're, oh crap, how do I get paid for my work? <laughs> you know, so you got to figure out, it, it's amazing yeah. just the similarities that Ryan and I come into. Um, I'm, I'm a DJ. My background's in, in doing events mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But as we've kind of done this podcast, uh, we've, we've kind of come to realize that a lot of the elements that pertain in his business also pertain in mine. And it's mm -hmm. just the universal language of business that kind of comes out. But Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, well, and I think especially for creatives, uh, you know, all that stuff, the accounting and everything else probably isn't most, most creative people's sort of first love. You know, they're not dying to do bookkeeping and all that stuff, but it is wildly important. So Macy's advice or Mace's advice of, of reaching out to an attorney and having sort of somebody you can get good legal counsel from is is key okay. too. And that's something I wish I'd have learned much earlier. Yeah, and it's it's just learn through what you go through really. I mean, it takes an experience in order to learn from like when it comes to client interactions, definitely lawyers are good to have um in terms of like advice, in terms of putting together contracts. Um, and I mean, it's it's definitely something that we don't really think about us wanting to do, but I think the more we engage in this type of business, we say, well, it's something that's gonna protect us. It's also gonna be something that we are able to just figure out a way and a process that works best for both sides. Um, so you kind of just get into the realm of it being something that is just it's, it nurtures your business. It nurtures the environment that you're in, as opposed to think of it yeah, as a as a chore or a dread or something. So, but it does take a while to get there in yeah. terms of like being comfortable with that resource and saying, okay, it's it's a need. Well, I think that's bit. a really good point, and I, I think too you sort of stumbled on something else that I think is is really important just to sort of say out loud. Like I think most people understand this, but I think a lot of people go to the internet and go to YouTube and go to wherever looking around for shortcuts and trying to find 
the quickest way to get to some end point. And uh, one of the things you just kind of mentioned offhanded while you were talking about that was this idea that it takes time. It takes experience. You you actually do need to, you know, you have to sort of try and fail and you have to, you know, have bad pitches and you have to have, you know, whatever it is, you have to have that those life experiences. You can't just learn it from, you know, watching something online or whatever. Well, you get a, a baseline understanding of it and then you kind of implement that on your on your own. But until you come across yeah. that situation, you don't even know what questions to yeah, ask. Yeah, I think that's fair. I just think there's so many people looking for the get get rich quick or the, the get to the end before you've done the diligence. And uh, like, I mean, I don't know, Mace, Mace, you can probably speak to this too, but I, I've met a number of people, at least in, in our industry that, uh, you know, that's kind of what they're looking for. They want to be the next big guy or the best, you know, next name illustrator or whatever. But most of them don't want to put in the time. You know, it's the ones who you never hear from, the guys that are the, the quiet sleepers that end up becoming the big names. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's definitely prevalent in the creative industry. And um, I recently heard a talk with um, Chris Doe and Brian Collins, who are actually mentioning some of those things, like uh, specifically to what you just said is Brian Collins was saying like mastery takes time. You know, it's, it's not just something that happens overnight. And so to hone in on your craft, to hone in on your business, to hone in on your skill sets, it's definitely a, a journey that is just, you have to learn to accept and move with whether it's the ups and downs, but, but yeah, it, it definitely something is, something where you're learning to go with the flow and just see like where it goes and also learning from each and every step of the way, yeah. every type of uh, experience that comes along. Yeah. A sure. lot of times I'll find, um, you know, I, I'm going along and one day I'll have kind of a breakthrough and in, in some capacity where I'd be like, I know exactly how to handle that problem or whatever it is. <laughs> and I always try and stop and think, okay, it took my whole lifetime worth of decisions to get to that point. So yeah. like no time wasted. Right. Because I, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm 39 now. And so it's like, I start to look back and I start thinking, God, did I use my time? Right. Did I do the right thing? You know, have I, you know, been wasting time on this or that or the other thing. And then I just stop and I try and correct myself by saying, you know, well, that well it's, even, even if you do look back and you think, Oh, did I waste all this time? There's nothing you can really do about it. It's, yeah, already, it's already in the past. Yeah. So it, really, it's only a matter of looking forward and yeah, trying to correct. Yeah, it's true. And, so, correct. and this, is, so this is how I'm dealing with it and trying to get my attitude right. But it is uh, but it is that. It's just this idea that it took every every decision I've made up to this moment is what led to this moment. And, yeah, uh, and that sort of helps me uh, <laughs> overcome those moments uh, when I'm feeling like I've uh, spun my wheels for too long on something. Of course, yeah. So, um, uh, on the questionnaire that we sent you, um, one of the questions we ask is what is your worst failure? And it's kind of one of those questions that's, you know, it could go a, a lot of different ways, but one of the things you said was that letting negative feedback get to you so personally was kind of one of the things that you struggled with. Uh, yeah. do you want to expound on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, and I think with kind of like what we're saying right now with success also comes negativity. Um, and I think there isn't really um, a school that prepares you for, for that level of like for success in general, but also what comes with the territory of success. Um, so that was just like a first try at what happened when um, what happened was we had a an exhibit that my friend and I uh, co-collaborated and co-curated, uh, my colleague Puya Jahanchai. And then what we um, encountered was some really great success along the way. I mean, our exhibit was local in California, in Los Angeles, and it got to travel to different cities. Um, and so it got a lot of press along the way, but at the same time, there was a lot of negative, I wouldn't say a lot of negative feedback, but some of the negative feedback was very painful to hear. Like what, so, I mean, were they attacking the art or were they attacking you as a person? No, attack, uh, personal attack. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. those are, I guess in all, every industry, there's the, the haters, they're, they're there always. Um, but I think what I would, what, what it's a, definitely a good learning experience to just take that part of it and just learn from it and say, you know what, there's, there's a grain of salt in there and there's probably something that I can learn from. 
Um, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that with that level of uh, success also comes that part of success. So it's part of the territory. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, you know, as a, as a designer or as a person who works in art, you know, you, especially in commercial art, you get really used to taking criticism. Oh, yeah. um, you know, so being able to handle critique and stuff is is sort of one of those skills that you get after you've been whipped on long enough by creative directors and <laughs> sure. uh, clients yeah. and everybody else about how how you could have done something better. Um, but the the personal attacks are never easy, and I think that's you, you know a nice thing to sort of acknowledge and and talk about, especially in kind of these modern times where it's so easy for someone to troll you. Or, um, oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know exactly the the circumstances surrounding your issue, but I can imagine maybe something to do with your your heritage or some things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Those, especially at different times in this country, have been really hot issues, and and so I can uh, you know imagine awful people saying awful things and you know that yeah. kind of stuff happens and and so being able to sort of understand and and i try or you know i've and my wife for example is a school teacher and so every now and then you know her uh students parents will come and say something awful or you know she'll get some bad rap from a student or something and you know i always try and explain to her god what was the one that was happening the other day she uh you know was just all upset over this this incident that had happened at school this kid was you know, really defiant, just awful. He just, he was saying horrible things. And I mean, they were discussing like the Holocaust and he was just like completely not empathetic to anything. Just like, you know, he's like, well, that Hitler's not such a bad guy, you know? And it's just like, you know, just, I mean, just, just, the, yeah, he's just trying boundaries. to cause problems, yeah. you know? I mean, he's just being a punk kid. These yeah. are eighth graders. And so, but, you know, my wife came home and was really troubled by this kid. And, and I tried telling her, I was like, well, you've got to try and you know, think about where he's coming from or where, you know, why would he, why would he behave like this? It's not because he really thinks Hitler's a great guy, but he's looking for attention. Maybe he's having problems at home. Maybe he comes from an abusive home or, you know, like, I mean, there's, there's some backstory that you're not privy to. And so a lot of times with these, you know, uh, attacks that, that people levy or the, the guys that go around and troll, you know, a lot of times it's that, you know, it's some kind of insecurity or some kind of problem in their own life. And, and I think like, like you said, Mace, dealing with the, or trying to find the grain of salt or whatever it is in, in their comments or trying mm -hmm. to empathize with maybe why they would think to say something like that, I think is like, I don't know, we would say like the, the taking the higher road, I guess, but I think it's uh, I think it's an important skill and I think it's not easy for everybody and it shouldn't probably be easy, but I think it's good to, uh, to sort of a, a address that anyway. Yeah. And I think that's where, um, having a community of like, uh, creatives that kind of look out for one another in that sense is really helpful. Um, just to kind of cultivate that level of confidence and to just confide with someone, um, about over I situation, um, it's just a different third point of view. And so, it's it's definitely helped me um i think it's just that first time around when you just get confronted just like with anything first time you're kind of sure i'm still navigating the waters in a way but then you kind of just learn through experience like okay this is how you handle things this is how you're supposed to kind of think about certain situations and not to take it personally because i mean creative uh, industries are tough um, and you're right we do have to have thick skin in order to survive um, and also understand what this industry is about um, yeah that definitely true yeah First. cool well yeah no sorry getting a little heavy but, no, uh, so but uh anyway so let's uh, jump back to the business for a minute let's talk a little bit about okay so now you've you've made the decision to go into business um yeah. you, you've always been a little bit entrepreneurial you're you're ready to go and, and get this thing moving can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about some of the challenges you had to overcome in building this business and like, I don't know, just some of the steps you took to kind of get going, you know, some of the things maybe you realized in the early days? Yeah. Um, I want to say like there were a few different hurdles. So one of them was um, just making sure that, you know, how I was working, I started off as a freelancer um, after I left the nine to five job. Um, so that meant that I was still the one doing the work. Um, and then realizing that, you know, that's easily not very scalable um, unless I start hiring people and collaborating with others. Um, so I realized that kind of in order to kind of hit another level in my business, I needed to, first of all, attract different kinds of clients that were a lot more um, 
just the types of clients that wanted bigger budgets to work with and just projects that were a lot more vast as opposed to just being one project or two. So we were talking about multiple different touch points for a brand identity or just a branding project in general. Um, so as like the clients grew, the team kind of grew. So it wasn't just me that was creating the work. Um, I started hiring um, a web designer for things that I don't know about. Um, so I'm familiar with web design, but I'm not the one who does web design. I always have to hire someone or a web developer. And I'm always more confident like that when I say, okay, I'm able to work with someone who has a better skill set than I do. So like hire someone who's better than me. So that, that mentality kind of had to shift a few years into the business. Um, but it took a few tries uh, to get there and realize like, you know, you you burn so quickly if it's just you. Um, so it's trying to maintain that, that level of, you know, making sure things are going okay, as well as like personally, as well as in the business. Um, but that was like the biggest shift is how do you scale from being a solopreneur to start hiring more people on your team and then yeah. figuring out well, your budget, your timeline, your project management. So, I mean, um, it took a few tries, um, but I think it's, it's good that I tried instead of being a little bit too fearful and say, well, this is uncharted territory for me, so why even go there in the first place? But um, just being around others who have been there as well and saying like, okay, well, those are the results that collaboration produces, what team building does. Um, and, and that was definitely the, like the good push that kind of said, okay, well, maybe this is something that we should do moving on right. with each project. That okay, kind of so I want to unpack a couple of things. First, I'm really frustrated that you came to that understanding way before I did. <laughs> I, I sat and dug it out myself for a long time before I got there. Um, second of all... I'm, I'm digging it out myself right now. <laughs> um, second of all, uh, one, one little thing you touched on, and I actually had found this on your website too, but I think it's really key. And uh, I also think it's really good in terms of, of trying to build a scalable business. Um, you mentioned that at, one, at some point you had to begin attracting larger clients that were more interested in multiple touch points. So yeah. I'm translating that as, um, you know, in, in the past, maybe I, I don't know what your old work was, but maybe it's logos. And so people are coming to you for one logo and then they're, you'd never see them again. Or maybe it's yeah. a flyer or something and they would just have you do these little onesie twosie projects. And so in order to scale, you needed bigger projects, more touch points. One mm -hmm. of the things I really liked about, uh, I mean, you know, obviously your website was built from the perspective of a storyteller. So, I, so you're trying to really help people navigate uh, your process. Mm -hmm. uh, on your page, deep in the dark back somewhere, you have a, like a frequently asked questions page. And in there, there's two spots, I think, where you mentioned logos specifically and then just a, like a continuation of that, some other uh, onesie twosie kind of project. And basically mm -hmm. you said, hey, you know, you can come to us for a logo. Or I think that the, the fake question and the frequently asked question was, hey, you know, I just need a logo. Can I come to you for a logo? Mm -hmm. And basically in Mesa's description, it says, no, you can't. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, you know, a, a logo is one of many touch points along this journey. But in order yeah. for us to really build a, a complete customer experience or user experience and build your brand story and all this stuff. We can't just have do a logo and give it to you and then walk away. Like we require that, you know, we're along the road, you know, and, yeah. and Mace, if I'm putting words in your mouth, feel free to correct me. But no, I think, uh, you know, but what I took from it or what I, what I thought was great about this is, is sort of the discipline to be willing to do that. And that uh, to sort of, you know, come out and say, no, I will not just take your logo job. I will gladly give you a referral. I'll pass you on to somebody else. I'll get you to the right person that can do that. But if you want to engage me or, or Macy Serafi Design, if you want to engage MSD, you need to come to us for like the whole package. You get the, you get the whole thing. And uh, yeah. and I think that that, that discipline it comes with maturity, I think, as part of it. But I think that that discipline is really difficult for a lot of, uh, especially people who come from a freelance background, Sure. Uh, because they're so used to just taking piecemeal, whatever thing they can get, you know, I'm, I'll just grab it, whatever project I can grab. And so, you know, myself included, we get into this habit of just taking whatever's given to us. And, mm -hmm. uh, I thought that that was really refreshing on your website, sort of the, uh, you know, the flat out indignation against all these onesie twosie projects. If you want to work with us, we want to tell your story, but we can only do it if we're allowed to do it. Yeah. Sometimes setting boundaries is key for 
scaling a business, you know, because if you keep taking these onesie twosies and you're not, you know, kind of setting your requirements of what you need to, to scale, mm-hmm. you're going to just kind of sit in that same spot. Yeah. So sure. I guess then to that end, to, uh, to land on a question, um, yeah. how did you, I guess, develop the, and, and maybe it is just maturity and time served, but can you talk a little bit about coming to the conclusion that, mm-hmm. hey, we're no longer taking every little project you push at us. Now no. we want to control the journey. Well, um, just like with the journey itself, we kind of have to evolve. Um, and I, I noticed myself just being as a freelancer that I needed to get some skill sets on my own and just learn how to grow. Um, that's where I came to um, the YouTube channel, The Future with Christelle. And that's kind of where I started to learn more about talking about pricing, talking about value-based pricing, um, starting to include brand strategy into our work. Um, And then as those components grew in our team, that's something that we started to have to charge more for. Um, But that's kind of where it started for me. Um, But that isn't to say that like if a client comes over just wanting to ask for a one touch point, a logo, um, that we couldn't turn around the conversation and say, well, well, why is it that you just want a logo and just open it up and say, just why is it that you think that you want just a one singular touch point for your brand? So, and I've had such interesting conversations with clients where, you know, sometimes they're just very adamant about having a logo. Others were open to the idea of, you know, seeing where this can go beyond a singular touch point and, you know, um, and and seeing like where this can go for them, their their goals, their their business goals, and where their brand can go. So there have been pivot points that have been uh, successful for us, um, and it's just the willingness for the client as well to be able to hear where this can go, and just for them to have a little bit more um, trust in the process um, and just see like that this is a large project. It's not really a small project, a brand, building a brand, building a brand around a business, whether it's a personal brand or a product driven brand um, needs a lot of like uh, projects that help support that brand, whether it be a website, a book, a brand identity system to help uh, grow and feed what that brand needs. Well, so, lots of times the the client's gonna, hey, I just want a logo, and then yeah. as you're discussing it, their eyes are kind of open to like, oh, I should do that too, and I should do this too, and they yeah. might not even know what they need until you kind of tell exactly. them. Exactly, exactly, and that's that's kind of where we started doing brand strategy and incorporating that into our work a little bit more. Um, we started to kind of take that portion of our work which we expand upon being brand strategy and just have that conversation and say well are you sure this is what you really need because based on your goals this is what this is where you might need to go and in a different direction or you might need other support elements to feed what it is that you need for your business so that's kind of where it all started was like when we started to include brand strategy as well just that conversation aside from the deliverables aside from design just have that conversation and open it up and just yeah see where that can go yeah you know? i think that that's yeah. that's really smart and and you know even in my own experience recently you know we, i've had i had a client come to me it was sort of the same thing they wanted oh. a a new package but couldn't explain to me why they needed the new package they wanted to rebrand yeah. all these different things you know and and it turned into a discussion like what you're talking about where you tried to give them some strategy to help them understand what it is, what they want. You know, I think a lot of times with clients, um, they don't often know what it is they really want. Like a logo is something easy to say. So they they say a logo, but what they really mean is all the things that make an awesome, successful logo because, you know, everybody wants to be Nike, but nobody wants to put the, you know, $20 billion Nike has spent behind their logo to make it the Nike logo. You yeah. know, everybody just wants the mark that will make the difference. And and it's, you know, a much sure. bigger story than that. So I think that's really good advice. Um, one yeah. thing you touched on in there that I wondered if you could extra, uh, uh, sort of expand on a little bit, if you uh, care to, is mm-hmm. this idea of value-based pricing. 
Yes. And uh, this is a little bit self-serving because it's something that I'm trying to go through also. As mm -hmm. a uh, Chris Doe disciple myself, I, <laughs> I cherry pick the things I like that he talks about. And uh, yeah. I think anything sort of around the idea of making more money, I think, is a uh, is pretty hot topic. And so there are one, one of the things he talks about, and I wish I could remember the guy's name, Mace, maybe you can remember. He had a guy talk on, come on uh, the future and talk uh, about value-based pricing. He did like an hour interview with this guy about uh, value-based pricing. And uh, I mean, from that moment forward, I've been trying to really figure out what value-based pricing means. Um, mm -hmm. the, th the struggle that I'm having largely with clients is how to articulate this. Because everybody yeah. lives in an hourly world. They're, they're used to, you know, they can wrap their head around the concept of this will take X number of hours, therefore it's worth X number of dollars. Sure. Um, but to Chris's point and to, to the point of others, you know, a logo, you know, you might sit down and spend 10 hours doing logos. You might have landed on the logo, the best logo in the first hour, you know, but should you only be paid for one hour of time? You know, it's yeah. not, not really fair to the designer. You're actually buying years of experience to get to that. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe expand on just the idea of value-based pricing and how it's working in your business? Sure. And I believe Christo was referring to Eli Cohen, um, who I believe is the CEO of Salesforce oh, okay. in San Francisco. Uh, so I believe he was the one who was talking about value-based pricing and, um, and marketing too. So, for me, I, I would say um, like it, it may, may have taken you one hour to get to that logo, but it took you how long in your education and in your journey to arrive at that decision? I mean, it took years and it took a lot of different levels of um, studying and drawing and gesture drawings and research to be able to get to that place where you can create a logo in in an hour, so you're so you're not really charging on just the the manpower to produce the logo, but you're you're charging for your ability to think, and and it's it's difficult because when you're able to articulate an idea that quickly, but you're you want to try to talk to your client in a way where they are valuing your thinking process more so than the making process because they know the the thinking process is what is key. The the design deliverable is pretty much the product, the byproduct of our thinking process. Well, you know, haven't yeah. I've heard Ryan say this a few times, and I'm not in the design world, so I don't really kind of yeah. relate to it. But mm -hmm. um, haven't you said before in the past, like when you work with an agency, like ninety percent of the time was spent on strategy, and the other ten percent was actually on design? Yeah, it's one of the sad realizations I had as a designer. And Macy, having come from nine to five, maybe you can relate. Um, for me, you know, I mean, I my trade is design, like I, art director, designer by trade, and. Yeah. You know, working in, in big agency for big clients, one of the things I discovered is, you know, we would have this massive, you know, $10 million bill, you know, 500 grand was design. The yeah. other, you know, 9.5 million was spent on strategy and planning and brand story and, and focus groups and user experience and all this stuff. And, yeah. you know, even though, I mean, as a designer, you know, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I mean, as a designer, I always sort of say, well, you know, we're, we're the last touch point, you know, I mean, like we're the, you know, we're the glue that takes all that strategy and puts it together, you know, so in, yeah. in my heart, uh, creativity and design is inherently important. Mm -hmm. But um, but when in terms it's all of broken down yeah, on the bill, but in terms of dollars yeah. and cents, it really makes up a small portion of what you actually do, which I think yeah. in large part is part of uh, Christo's concept that that strategy is the most important thing, and you really should be selling strategy. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think any designer, freelancers especially, I mean, you sell. I mean, you sell design to your clients anyway. I mean, you sell strategy to your clients anyway when you're doing a logo or you're doing uh, a flyer or a website or whatever. I mean, you're coaching your client on strategy the whole time you're designing. Oh, you know, for sure. You're just not yeah. being paid for it. <laughs> so. <laughs> and you need to watch out for that. It's like, okay, how, when am I giving too much? Or when am I going to say, no, I need to charge for this session, this consultation, mm -hmm. which a lot of designers are now doing. They're transitioning their business into like, you know, uh, you can get the first hour for 250 and just we can have just a conversation to start where this can go. And, you know, it, it can start there. But I think when we start to inject value-based pricing, um, just in terms of like, how much our work is worth. I mean, there really is no way to put a price on that because 
I mean, for me, just personally, I, I value design. I value the craft. I value the aesthetic part so much that I still think uh, designers are still being underpaid for what they do. Um, but aside from even the brand strategy part, that I think they should be paid handsomely for because we even look at just what it took to produce something like a package design and just think about the whole team that was part of that initiative. I mean, there is a, a production artist, there is the designer, there is the typographer, there is the illustrator, there is someone who might be the structural engineer. So I feel like that a lot of it has to also go to design as well. I mean, if I were to restructure it my way, I'd say half, half equally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and yeah, like I say, it's, it's really difficult because, you know, I think a lot of times design becomes commoditized and actually it's one of the things yeah. that later in my career or even more recently in my career, mm -hmm. um, I, I've found is one of the, the things keeping me from doing the most design and spending most of my time in strategy land is mm -hmm. for that very reason is that people are, are trying to compete, you know, put like somebody like me up against a, a design pickle, or I always joke that my biggest competition is anybody's cousin because everybody has a cousin that runs Photoshop <laughs> yep. and uh, you know, and so it, it's difficult, you know, because design has become something that you can just churn and burn and social media has contributed to this. And, you know, yeah. the sort of design standards being allowed to slip because we can just throw out these funny memes that don't really require a lot or of design there's sense an app and, for that. Or, yeah, yeah. And there's apps that'll automate things and all kinds of stuff. And so you're taking people who are classically trained and pitting them against, you know, technology or software. And, you know, you almost always find, or at least in my experience, you'll find that the trained craftsperson is still going to provide the better output. Oh, but, yeah. But sometimes sure. it's a battle, you know, or an argument with clients even, you know, whether or not they need that level of quality. And yeah. uh, I always argue they do, but they don't always agree. Well, the app's not going to know the overall game plan. It's just going to, you know, push the button and get what you get out of it kind of thing and hope it's what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, so. yeah. I mean, um, but you see designers who are already starting to challenge that notion and say, you know, Fiverr is not our competition. And we're, they'll outright say that. And But also takes the type of client to understand the difference between well-crafted design versus something that's been cheaply designed or that hasn't had that much thought into it or that much process. Because another thing is process. When you take a look at the process and where it is that you started and where it is that you began – and where you landed on your decision um, comes from an informed series of informed decisions um, that you're making with the client. Um, so with a highly skilled designer who's trained in this way of thinking, um, you're, you're definitely getting a lot more value that way too for the, for the way that you work, for the way that they think, for them asking you the right questions. So it, it all comes down to like this whole experience that you have from beginning to end too. And it's not just about the final deliverable because you also want your client to come back to you because it's not just about what is it produced, but it's also the relationship that you're establishing with them too. And how easy is it for them to work with you and for you to understand their problems. Um, so it, it is a lot more complex than just, you know, a one touch point logo or an sure. illustration here or there, you know? Yeah. So. Well, and I think you raised a good point, too, in saying that, you know, designers are are kind of pushing back against this by saying things like Fiverr is not really my competition and, you know, stuff oh, like yeah. that. And I think maybe this is a little bit of a freelancer's mentality. So I, maybe you have a, a similar experience. But um, I think when you get so used to years and years of kind of scrapping for every little thing that somebody will give you. You start to yeah. think that your business is a commodity or the trade that you have is a commodity and that you are competing yeah. against these little gig opportunities, you know, like the like the Fivers and like the, you know, stepdad or cousin that knows Photoshop, you know, like yeah. you start to feel like you're competing against them because you're all just scrapping for the same money at the bottom of the pile. Sure. When yeah. in reality, there's there's plenty of work for everybody. Like, I mean, uh -huh. you know, there's a spot for people who are budget centric and want to use something like Fiverr. There's people mm -hmm. who have bigger budgets who are much more interested in your in picking your brain and getting your experience. Well, that, and there's that, everything in between. The same thing applies to like the DJ community, too. Like you got the entry level guys that just bought their first set of speakers and haven't really mm -hmm. done it before. There's a spot for them and there's a yeah. spot for the three thousand dollar wedding yeah. DJ, you know, so it, it's you got to kind of 
know where you're where you're at. Well, and that's the thing. I think if if people have enough confidence to understand that they are not, you know, you're not going to win every job. You just have to win the jobs that work for you. And yeah. then you don't feel like you have to compete against Fiverr. You know, this was one of my complaints early on when I was younger was uh, platforms like, well, what it, it used to be called Elance. Now it's Upwork. Upwork. Yeah. But um, but my big drama was I, w- I was competing against people in Pakistan and Malaysia and in places like that because I was in my head, I was only competing on price. And so I was like, well, I can't beat their price. I mean, these guys are working for five, 10, $15 an hour. I was like, I can't feed my kids on that. You know, <laughs> like I've got, I've got to do better than five or 10 bucks an hour. And, uh, it took me some time to sort of get, you know, enough maturity, I guess, to understand the difference, you know, or that what I bring to the table isn't just being good in illustrator or good in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. It's all these other things too. Oh yeah, definitely. For sure. It's, it's all, the whole package, really. So um, we're getting close to wrapping this up. I, I had a, a question for you. Um, it, I noticed on your, your info here that you uh, like to cook and you like mm-hmm. to gather recipes and get the stories behind the recipes. Um, are you working on a cookbook? Are you working on something that's kind of cooking related? <laughs> Uh, oh, so right now, uh, currently, I have a client who I'm working for as a food photographer. Oh, and nice. Cooker. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit of background history. Um, my my mom grows an edible garden. And so one of the things I grew up with was that sustainable ability to eat and grow your vegetables. Um, so, I think that's an important thing that a lot of us should kind of try uh, and emulate and take on uh, to. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if like, um, I also teach too. So my background in teaching has always been say, okay, well, what's something that I can produce that I can teach. So one of them is recipes. One of them is like putting together a cookbook. Um, so in a way that, that kind of helps feed my, um, self-initiated projects, um, in a way that say, okay, well, how can we take this hobby and the project and see if this can be turned into a product that would then be done and then produced and then marketed in a certain way. So that's kind of how I see some certain things about the things that we like, like hobbies and how they mm-hmm. can turn into um, a little business idea um, or even just like a support for uh, product development. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing, and, and this is something that comes up a lot on this show. I'm sure Mike's rolling his eyes as I'm about to ask it. But, <laughs> um, but you might be a, a good person to ask in particular. Um, so one of the discussions we've had a lot, we've had a lot of people like Chris Doe who have online education platforms and things like that on, on our show. Uh, a couple of people that own you know large tech-based versions of that and Chris himself and other guys from the future uh, have all been on the show. And so, but one of the things that we keep asking them is the place of traditional education versus sort of a contemporary or online education. And you're an interesting hybrid because you've kind of, you, you've taken resources from people like Christo, yet you're really involved in traditional style education. Um, mm-hmm. I know a lot of designers come up a path where they're sort of self-taught and online resources are, you know, amazing for young designers now because a lot of this didn't exist when I was a kid. But um, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on, you know, just education in general, maybe what the future of education might look like for creatives and uh, the role you think that sort of online versus traditional education might play. Yeah, I, I honestly think it's a, it's, it's a tough uh, call because I think just in general um, business, I think education is still a business at the end of the day. Um, and you are seeing some uh, challenges happening in the brick and mortar um, example of education. Um, But it's also not to say that it's not important. It is important that you have to go and kind of experience a specific kind of training in order to get the skill sets that you need. But what I thought with the uh, online educational way of, uh, just way of learning online was interesting because uh, there was a community that was being formed and you kind of form more communities in smaller groups and kind of learn together as you go. So I'm part of like three Facebook groups that have cultivated that way of learning and thinking. And it's been very helpful. I think it's, it's something where you're able to take learning and kind of just 
take it in a way where like you apply this in your business on a daily basis um, and then share if there's something going on, something's not going right. There's always a community for you to share that with uh, versus like when you're in a brick and mortar type of system, you can always fall back on your teachers. Um, but sometimes that's not available. So I feel like that was something that I stumbled upon with like the online community was having that ability to always reach out to someone and always having that feedback and conversation ongoing um, in tandem with your business. Um, and it's been very helpful. I think for me, I, I, like, I like to take a little bit of both um, just because I, I do teach in a brick and mortar uh, school system. But for me, I, I felt like if, I, if there's a way for me to learn how to do more about my work, which is art direct and hire more creatives, um, it's definitely learning how to teach and teaching other teams and teaching other creatives. So whether it's online or in a brick and mortar system, it's, it's definitely important well, to have knowledge throughout. There's also the, the fact of when you have to actually teach someone how to do something, you learn it a lot faster yourself than if you were to just kind of listen to someone else teaching you. When you actually have to pass that knowledge along, it kind of sticks in your brain a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. And it's even interesting when you're, when you're like learning through teaching, uh, which is something I uh, wrote about with um, Zach Schmaes over on the straight method, where we talk about when you're teaching and you're also teaching yourself how to learn and you're teaching others how to learn as well. So it's kind of like this cycle that kind of moves um, in tandem. And, and when you're able to apply that to your own business, um, it kind of works wonderfully just as a practice as a whole teaching and learning and applying yeah yeah that's awesome cool all right well to start to wrap this thing up um one last thing that that mike often likes to ask of our people do you have any books or anything you can recommend that you've been reading recently or that have contributed to some of the knowledge you've got yeah i want to say uh the blair ends book was definitely a great resource uh one without pitching was uh, a really good book to learn. I think the straightforward language, it's not a long read. It's definitely something that can be finished fairly quickly. I was going to say, um, if there's illustrations or, or pictures, then it's easy for me. That's even better. Um, and then I want to say um, uh, Douglas Davis's book about uh, creativity and strategy, uh, learning the business set behind the creative industry. Learning more about that realm has definitely been a um, very eye-opening experience. Uh, these two have been really good books to have um, in my shelf. Um, but I also like uh, to look at typography books too and just learn more about like what makes a good font, what makes a good typeface, what's a good font to use. So that's kind of like balancing out business resources also with like design resources. Um, that's kind of like where I see myself going. That's terms awesome. of, well, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for that. Um, I guess uh, in closing, where can people find you, Mace? You can find me um, at maceserafi.com. Uh, you can also find me at that same handle on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook too. And um, and mostly on Instagram and Facebook, um, but occasionally I'll be on Twitter. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that's awesome. I wish we had just hours and hours to talk because I've got so much to say, as was apparent in our four-hour bomber when I was down in Santa Monica. But really mm -hmm. awesome to meet you and so great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. My pleasure. And thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And uh, with that, we'll uh, we'll sign off for another week, but uh, we'll do it again. So okay. thanks to everybody who tuned in and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>